Hey everyone, it's Tyler Putman with the Museum of the American Revolution. I'm back with another one of our Living History at Home cooking demonstrations, and I'm really excited to have a special guest today. You might recognize Nicole Belolan from our Occupied Philadelphia Living History events, or because she's been making a few cameos in our videos. Normally she's the camera person, she did get to taste some of the pumpkin, but today I've invited her because she has experience portraying one of the people we're going to talk about. So, hey Nicole. Hi. Can you tell us a little bit about your work when you're not filming me as a historian? Absolutely. Well, I'm a historian of early America and I focus on disability history. And I also work at Rutgers Camden where I direct a continuing education program in historic preservation. And also as part of that position, I'm an editor with the National Council on Public History. So Nicole has all these interesting jobs as a historian, and one of her avocations, her hobbies, is living history. So we're dressed in 18th century clothing, and we're going to talk a little bit about one of the people that she's portrayed, a woman named Mary Humphreys. We're really interested in Mary Humphreys not because she's necessarily a famous person or someone you've heard of, but because the museum has a lot of her trash. Before we built the museum, we did an archeological survey on the footprint of our building in what's now Old City, Philadelphia. We found over 85,000 artifacts dating all the way back to the 1740s. And most of these objects came from trash pits and privy pits, toilets. So today we're actually gonna make a meal inspired by things found in Mary Humphrey's privy in her toilet. So Nicole, what else do we know about Mary Humphreys? Mary Humphreys was born in 1730 in Philadelphia. She was a Quaker. She married a man named Benjamin Humphreys, and Benjamin was a cutler. He would have sharpened tools, made very practical tools like screws and nails that would have been used by laborers, but also in domestic households. In 1776, Mary and Benjamin moved to Carter's Alley, and that's right around the site, on the site of the current Museum of the American Revolution. And that year was also important because Mary and Benjamin freed a woman who had been enslaved with them, Quanchaba. And it seems that Quanchaba stayed on with Mary and Benjamin as probably a domestic servant who would have helped with cooking and cleaning and all the other tasks that 18th century people had to do every day to keep their households neat and tidy. Mary and Benjamin are distinctive also because they probably ran an illegal tavern. In the 1780s, Mary was found guilty of running what was called a disorderly house. Now that's a term that historians have found many definitions for in the period. We don't know precisely what was going on in Mary's disorderly house. We don't know exactly what was disorderly about her house. But because of the archaeological evidence that the archaeologists uncovered, in the course of building the museum. We do know that they found a lot of drinking vessels and serving utensils, platters, and that led us to believe that perhaps they were running an illegal tavern and that might have been what was disorderly about Mary's house. It's really amazing in that privy, we see over a hundred alcohol bottles, uh, way more than you would need in a typical household. So it was really exciting to match a pretty minor court record in Philadelphia of this one prosecution of Mary Humphreys with what we actually see in her trash. And it was also a really amazing privy, a place people threw out refuse uh, as well as used the toilet because it had all sorts of food remains in it. So we found um, even tiny things, blackberry seeds, strawberry seeds, a lot of mutton bones, so adult sheep bones, uh, way more than you would think the average household would be eating, but maybe the sort of thing you would have found in a, a tavern, or at least an illegal tavern. And we thought about making mutton today as a demonstration, really popular 18th century food, um, but we, we're probably not going to do that for two reasons. One is mutton's kind of hard to find. You can find lamb pretty easily, but adult sheep meat is kind of difficult to find. And two, we wanted to give you guys something that you might have a pretty good shot at being able to cook from home with a quick trip to the grocery. But where it got interesting was figuring out what recipe to use. So um, Nicole, where, where did we find our recipes? Where did people get recipes in the 18th century? Lots of places. Just like today, you might ask your 
my grandmother or your uncle uh, for their favorite recipe that they've used historically, you might write it down, you might remember it, you might buy a cookbook from a bookseller. And people in the 18th century, like Mary Humphreys, would have gotten recipes from essentially the same places. Family tradition, a, a manuscript, so written down recipes that they would have kept in, say, a diary style notebook, printed recipe books that they could have bought at booksellers, um, their own imagination. <laughs> I'm sure lots of people improvised also, depending on what was available. So there are a lot of different options historically, just like there were today. We have a lot of Mary Humphrey's physical artifacts that were associated with her life. As far as I know, there are very few archival documents associated with her life, and certainly no cookbooks or recipes that we've been able to identify in a repository or a private collection yet. That said, in order to figure out what Mary and Benjamin and their customers might have been eating at the time of the American Revolution, we can look to other period manuscript recipes and printed recipes to get a sense of the types of things that people would have put into, say, a chicken dish or a mutton dish. And so for that, we looked at one source of digitized recipes. Of course, we're home right now. We can't go to an archive. Luckily, lots of museums have digitized some of their manuscript and their object collections. One example of that is the Winter Tour Museum in Delaware. They have an amazing collection of objects and archives and ephemera dating from 1650 up through the early 20th century, in fact. They have a really good collection of historic recipes. Some of them have been digitized and you can access them yourself online through their website. So what we did was we went to see what they do have digitized. We narrowed our search terms by the time period we were interested in. And we brought in this to the 18th century because it would be difficult to find a chicken recipe from 1776 in Philadelphia. So we did use a manuscript book uh, of recipes that was kept by a woman named Elizabeth Cultus. She probably lived in the Philadelphia area in the mid to late 18th century. I think actually Kevin can probably show us the cover of her book right now. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you again to Winator for digitizing this awesome source. And so we went through her book and found a chicken recipe with not too many ingredients that we thought might be doable for cooking today for all of you. And the thing I really like about these cooking demonstrations is that they emphasize everyday life in a time of extraordinary upheaval like the revolution. So it's important to remember that we think a lot about battles when we talk about war, which are certainly important, but people kept living their lives. They had to eat, they socialized, they apparently had to get a drink at a bar every now and then too as well. So it will be interesting to share with you what that everyday life was like through Mary Humphreys. So let's take a look at the ingredients you're gonna to need to make two dishes. Today we're gonna to make Elizabeth Coltis's white chicken fricassee, and we're gonna make a really simple potato side dish that comes to us from the cookbook of a woman named Hannah Glass, who was a British cookbook author, and you can find a lot of versions of her book online as well. If you check out Elizabeth Coltis's original recipe book, you'll notice that it's a little more complicated than the version we're gonna do. It requires four chickens, and she doesn't always say exactly how much of which ingredient to use or how long to cook it for. So we've simplified it a little bit. We're gonna use just one chicken and we're gonna see what the results are like. So if you give this a try and it's a success, don't forget to tag us at AMREV Museum and to tag the Winterthur Museum as well. So Nicole, what do we have here? All right, so Mary and Kwanshaba would have gotten four chickens, but in our case, we're going to use one chicken seen here. You can also use four chicken breasts if you prefer, a cup of milk, half a cup of white sauce or gravy, which I think Tyler's going to tell you a little bit more about. Yeah, you might be wondering what kind of white sauce, what kind of gravy. If you check out Elizabeth Coltis's recipe, she requires white veal gravy. Thanks to the Museum of the American Revolution's curator, Mark Turdo, 
we were able to do a little more research into what white veal gravy was. It was often made with veal knuckles and herbs. Sometimes you would add cream to it. So today you can use any kind of gravy you want or bouillon or stock. I've just made a quick white sauce with milk, butter, and flour. Thanks, Tyler. To this, we're going to add a cup of sliced mushrooms, a sprig of fresh thyme, a teaspoon of mace or nutmeg, two tablespoons of butter, quarter cup of flour, one egg yolk, three tablespoons of dry white wine or vermouth. This is optional. I bet Mary Humphreys would have included it though. Absolutely. <laughs> a quarter cup of cream, a tablespoon of capers, and one lemon cut into wedges. Once you've assembled all your ingredients, it's time to start cooking. I'd say that counts as just covered. We're waiting for the chicken to cook. So in the meantime, we're going to throw together an easy 18th century side dish. We got this recipe from Hannah Glass's cookbook. This was a printed cookbook that perhaps Mary or someone like Mary might have referenced in the late 18th century. This is a potato recipe. It's quite simple. You take as many potatoes as you want, put them into a pot, cover them just to the top with water, boil them until their skins crack and you may need to add a little bit more water to achieve that. Once they seem to be soft to your liking, empty the pot of the water, serve the potatoes, and pour melted butter on top. Doesn't that sound great? We just beat the egg yolk a little bit, we added the vermouth, which you can leave out if you want, and now we're going to add in the cream as well. Mix it up a little bit. Now we're ready to add it along with the capers. Next we are adding the capers to the chicken and that cream mixture we just put together. We're going to stir it and cook for about another minute. The last thing you should do, just for the sake of food safety, which is something we think about and that they understood in the 18th century without thermometers, is to make sure that your chicken registers 160 or 165 degrees at its thickest points with an instant read thermometer. This is the butter and flour, mixing it together. It's gonna to be what we use to thicken up the liquid in the fricassee. It's gonna be a little crumbly, Get it until it's nicely integrated and golden brown. And then give that a stir into the chicken. So that actually didn't take long at all to cook. It'd be an easy weeknight meal even, as it might have been in Mary Humphrey's household. So without further ado, should we give it a taste? Let's do it. It looks good. It smells good. Surprisingly tender. You can definitely taste the dairy. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty rich. And you know, ours had a lot of liquid in the pot, so if you wanted a little less, you might reduce the amount. If you wanted more zestiness, you could add a few more capers. Elizabeth Coltis's recipe book even says you can add different types of pickles if you want, or some of this lemon juice. You know, tasting this food, wearing the clothing, using recipes like the one at Winterthur, objects like the ones we uncovered from the ground beneath the museum. All of these are really exciting ways to get a little closer to life in the past. We talk a lot about walking on the deck of a ship or wearing the clothing to imagine what life was like, but there are still things we don't know, right, about life in the 18th century? Absolutely. As we were going through the recipe, preparing the ingredients, 
talking about where people got their recipes, that really conjured a lot of questions for me about, well, how much cooking did Mary actually do for the tavern? How much cooking did Quanchipa do? To what extent did she influence what some of these recipes might have tasted like? Did they actually like chicken and mutton or were they just eating it because that was what was available? Some of these questions we can investigate more. We're really excited at the museum to be able to display some of the things that were in the Humphreys family privy. You can explore objects like the Trifina punch bowl on our website. And we even have some of Mary Humphreys tea set on display in our Revolution Place Discovery Center. So if you give this chicken fricassee a try, don't forget to let us know how it turns out at AmRev Museum, and uh, good luck with your cooking.